talking about um, physicality, we're talking about relationships, we're talking about if a relationship could survive. If one of you suffered an accident that left you needing total round-the-clock care. Yeah, well, that's exactly what happened to Ed Jackson when he was 28. He was fit, healthy, a professional rugby player, um, had a beautiful fiancé, but a freak accident changed everything, um, leaving him with life-changing injuries. There he is in hospital. Hard to believe, um, looking at those pictures, four years on, Ed and his now wife, Lois, are here to talk to us. And you walked in this morning, which is amazing to see, because reading about you, how you got to this stage is absolutely incredible. And welcome, Lois. Well, it, it's, it verges on miraculous because basically Ed's going to tell you the story now. All was well, one spring day. Was it a barbecue or a party you were at? Nice sunny day and then you made a decision to jump into a pool. Tell us about the day and what, what happened. Yeah, so it was um, April the 8th, 2017. I remember it quite well. But I was just at a family friend's house having, having lunch. Um, first hot day of the year, so obviously you find a friend who's got a swimming pool. Um, I'd never been in the pool before and it was kind of a feature pool with a waterfall in one end and a rock face and just wasn't concentrating, you know, took off my T-shirt, turned around, dived in where the waterfall hit the water. That obviously meant I couldn't see the bottom because the, the water was disturbed, thinking it was going to be about eight or nine feet deep, but it turned out to only be about three feet deep. Um, and as you saw from the photo, I was quite a bit bigger back then. There was a lot of weight to go through the top of my head. Uh, first of all, I was just like, oh, I've hit my head hard there. You know, I'll just stand up and check if I'm bleeding. Um, but then I quickly realised something was seriously wrong when I couldn't move. So who saw you and got you out? Luckily, my dad was in the pool and one of my friends, um, and they came over and pulled me to the surface, uh, and I'd stopped moving by that point. Um, but I was still completely conscious. Fortunately, my dad's a retired GP, so he knew there must be something wrong with my head or spine, so he kept me stable in the pool, which made a massive difference in the end because my neck at the time was dislocated and my spinal cord had been cut in half, so what was a 12 millimeter was now 6 millimeters. So he was keeping you afloat, afloat, ambulance arrives, obviously, you're rushed to hospital. I understand you had cardiac arrest on the way. Do you remember any of that? Um, I just remember feeling a bit sleepy. There was no bright lights or mm. pearly gates, but I thought it was a 15-minute journey to hospital and when I got to hospital I thought that's all it took but it turned out the journey was actually two and a half hours because they kept having to pull over to resuscitate me. So, so you, uh, you actually physically died like yeah. two times at least two times? Yeah. Um, so Lois meanwhile you I think you were playing netball at the time yeah you? yeah and uh, you get the phone call you get to the hospital how bad is the prognosis what are you told? Yeah, well, luckily, Ed's stepmom did the call and kept me really calm, didn't really tell me all the details. But when I got there, it kind of just felt like I was in 24 hours in A&E, you know, his head was strapped down with one of those red kind of helmet things and he was shaking, I think, from adrenaline as well. And, um, yeah, he just kind of looked at me and said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, like... Because I think at that time, he just thought kind of our lives and what we'd had planned was was over. So. One of the things she had planned was to get married. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was. And, um, yeah, we, we put that on hold, obviously, straight away. Um, just didn't know what the outcome was going to be. Um, but, yeah, it was pretty scary in those in those first few moments. And, and you had to go straight into surgery, a uh, huge operation, metal plate in your neck. Um, what did they tell you after that? Um... Well, when, before I went into surgery, you know, they, they said, look, there's a chance this, this will make you better, there's the chance it won't do anything, but there's also a chance you won't wake up from this surgery because it was a seven-hour spinal cord sur surgery. You had to remove bits of disc from, from my spinal cord. Fortunately, I did wake up, so that was the first thing. But then when, when I then was in intensive care, I was like, well, I'll try and wiggle my toes, wiggle my feet, and I had nothing. So I was just sort of a head on a pillow and... That nightmare had become a reality then. That, that thing you hear happening to other people was all of a sudden new. So mm -hmm. um, after seven days of no movement and sensation still, I was kind of told, you know, you need to come to terms with the fact you're not going to walk again. Hopefully you'll get the use of your arms back to use a wheelchair, which was obviously a bit of a tough thing to hear. Well, not only Matthew. did they say you're not going to walk again, but you couldn't feel anything at that stage from your chest downwards. Um, the prognosis, not good. I don't know what the expectation was for you, but could I just say, in, you know, in my minor way, I've two slip discs and uh, I've got problems walking and whatever, whatever, that's been going on for three months, and I get quite depressed about it sometimes, and I think this is not going to get better. My friend, how humbled am I reading your story and listening to you because your prognosis was, that's it. 
basically, and I watched you today walk into the studio, walk across here. How are you doing that? <laughs> um, I've been incredibly lucky, and like you can only recover to within the scope of your injury. And yes, I was told I was never going to walk again, but there was obviously a chance. And actually, when I was delivered that message, I had a weird response. It was hard to hear, but I remember looking at Lois and my mum, who were in the room, they obviously burst into tears. And I just thought, this isn't just about you anymore. You know, the word independence means these people could be caring for you for the rest of your life. And I made the decision then that if in six months' time I looked back and I hadn't done everything I could to get better, I'd never forgive myself if they were then having to be my full-time carer. Mm. But if they were... I was still in that position, still in that bed, but I know I'd done everything and it was out of my hands, then at least I could make peace mm. with that. So it just motivated me to, to, to get going and spend every waking moment trying to trying to move something. Well, it's incredible what you've done, but let's talk about that. You mentioned your mum there and Lois. I'm worrying, you know, this could mean that they'll be my carers for the rest of my life. You're a young couple, young woman, and, you know, you're planning to get married, your future life ahead of you, and this life was now going to be very different. Mm -hmm. um, what was going through your mind at that point? Did you talk together about your relationship, what it meant for you going forward, having a family, mm. being a carer? You know, it was a lot on your plate and a lot to think about. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot to take on and I think at the beginning we were quite bad with the communication because you're both trying to be strong for each other so you don't want to let the other person see that you're struggling um, and it was actually for me probably once we returned um, from hospital because in hospital you're in that kind of bubble and then you go home and you're meant to get on with this normal life and the normal life isn't normal anymore it's completely different and Ed had changed so much not only just Physically, he'd lost so much weight. Um, he'd also, his whole outlook on life had changed. So for me, I think it was kind of getting used to the new Ed and, and falling in, in love with the new Ed. And there was other issues. So um, Did like you worry you might not fall in love with the new Ed? I think at times, because like in society, there's a lot of pressures that if you're not doing certain things in certain ways, then are you in love? And, and obviously that was completely taken away from us. Like bladder, bowels and sexual function and she's a part of spinal cord injury um, and it was something very new that I didn't think I would be kind of going through until I was in your 80s and you're trying to look after all those things so um, yeah it really did take some getting used to and, and the communication I've realised was so key because there was a point where I did have a chat with Ed and I said I'm really struggling um, and we kind of stripped it back then and kind of rebuilt our relationship from there. And... Were you worried Ed that she might not want to stay? Well, after a couple of weeks, I actually told her to leave me, Did you know, <laughs> because I was feeling so guilty about the situation. I was like, you didn't sign up for this. And she, of course, told me to shut up and yeah. stop being so <laughs> right, stupid. So that was nice to hear. But then, like I said, further down the line, when she delivered that news, you know, I was having a bit of an identity crisis at that time, gone from a professional rugby player to being very much disabled and struggling. And then to hear that, it was a bit of a, you know, it was a it was hard to hear, but it was the best thing that could have happened. And Lois had been bottling up for six months. She'd just been a complete rock for me. Um, and actually gave us a platform to rebuild from then. And we've never been better. And did that give you more, more reason to move forward, to try and get mobile again and give you that focus? Like you said, originally you thought you had that because you thought, I've got to try for Lois and your mum. I'm so lucky to have Lois and I've always known that since the start so um, actually and, and having the focus on her a lot of the time through my recovery was what made the difference for me to be able to put the effort in put those hours and hours a day of effort into recovering first of all it was trying to give us some quality of life back so Lois wouldn't be a carer then of course we had the wedding on the horizon we, we put that back in the diary and I wanted to be able to stand at the altar or walk down the aisle um, and we... you did mm. <laughs> there yeah. you are beautiful oh, photograph did, yeah. Yeah. which is amazing and you you not only rediscovered each other, you had to rediscover another role in life from being a professional rugby player with wasps and dragons in, in, in Cardiff. Um, what do you do now together, Lois? What do you do? Yeah, so we, uh, we started a charity called Millimetres to Mountains, which encapsulates Ed's journey from not being able to, to move to now climbing mountains and uh, he likes to set these challenges uh, despite my nerves um, and yeah he wants to keep climbing higher and higher to kind of raise awareness for other people that have gone through life-changing injuries or illnesses that actually so much more is possible and you're more capable than you know. Well um, it's all here in your book Ed and uh, it's simply got the, got the title Lucky but the thing is um, it is um, from tragedy to triumph one step at a time, literally has been one step at a time. 
It's an amazing story. It will be an inspiration to so many people. There's so much more I'd love to talk to you about, about you know, questioning that day, about diving into that pool. And it's, it's a common injury. So, and so many mm. people do it as, as well, unfortunately. Um, continue to get well. Continue to get better one step at a time. Continue climbing mountains. And, yeah. um, <laughs> I will. And, and also, yeah. you're off to Tokyo to present at the Paralympics now. Yeah, aren't I you? can't wait. Next big challenge, you know, for, for me, but so exciting. So, Paralympics. Paralymp I've been, been inspired by the Paralympics since before my disability, yeah. you know, the London Games and the Rio Games, and now to be a part, as play a small part in it in the broadcasting sense is, is going to be. Well, you'll amazing. be fantastic, I'm sure. Um, lovely to meet you both. Lovely to Thank you, you so much. I'm going to double my physio this yeah. week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I know some good physios you need. Couple of numbers. Oh, good. <laughs> Give Thank them some you. exercises to much. do <laughs> before you go.